He was the color of blood, not the springing blood of the heart, but the blood that stirs under an old wound that never really healed. A terrible light poured from him like sweat, and his roar started landslides flowing into one another. His horns were as pale as Scaur's. For one moment the unicorn faced him, frozen as a wave about to break. Then the light of her horn went out and she turned and fled. The red bull bellowed again and leaped down after her. The unicorn had never been afraid of anything. She was immortal, but she could be killed. By a harpy, by a dragon or a chimera, by a stray arrow loosed at a squirrel. But dragons could only kill her. They could never make her forget what she was, or themselves forget that even dead she would still be more beautiful than they. The red bull did not know her, and yet she could feel that it was herself he sought, and no white mare. Fear blew her dark then, and she ran away while the bull's raging ignorance filled the sky and spilled over into the valley. The trees lunged at her, and she veered wildly among them. She who slipped so softly through eternity without bumping into anything. Behind her, they were break breaking like glass in the rush of the red bull. He roared once again, and a great branch clubbed her on the shoulder so hard that she staggered and fell. She was up immediately, but now roots humped under her feet as she ran, and others burrowed as busily as moles to cut across the path. Vines struck at her like strangling snakes. Creepers wove webs between the trees. Dead boughs crashed all around her. She fell a second time. The bull's hooves on the earth boomed through her bones, and she cried out. She must have found some way out of the trees, for she was running on the hard, bald plain that lay beyond the prosperous pastures lands of ha Hagsgate. Now she had room to race, and a unicorn is only loping when she leaves the hunter kicking with his burst and sinking horse. She moved with the speed of life, winking from one body to another, or running down a sword, swifter than anything burdened with legs or wings. Yet, without looking back, she knew that the red bull was gaining on her, coming like the moon, the sullen, swollen hunter's moon. She could feel the shock of the livid horns in her side, as though he had already struck. Ripe, shark, sharp corn stalks leaned together to make a hedge at her breast, but she trampled them down. Silver wheat fields turned cold and gummy when the bull breathed on them. They dragged at her legs like snow. Still she ran, bleeding and defeated, hearing the butterflies' icy chiming. They passed down all the roads long ago, and the red bull ran close behind them. He had killed them all. Suddenly the bull was facing her, as though he had been lifted like a chess piece, swooped through the air and set down again to bar her way. He did not charge immediately, and she did not run. He had been huge when she first fled him, but in the pursuit he had grown so vast that she could not imagine all of him. Now he seemed to curve with the curve of the bloodshot sky, his legs like great whirlwinds, his head rolling like the northern lights. His nostrils wrinkled and rumbled as he searched for her, and the unicorn realized that the red bull was blind. If he had rushed her then, she would have met him, tiny and despairing with her darkened horn, even though he stamped her to pieces. He was swifter than she, better to face him now than to be caught running. But the bull advanced slowly, with a kind of sinister daintiness, as though he were trying not to frighten her, and again she broke before him. With a low, sad cry, she whirled and ran back the way she had come, back through the tattered fields and over the plain toward King Haggard's castle, dark and hunched as ever, and the red bull went after her, following her fear. Schmendrick and Molly had been spun away like chips when the bull went by. Molly slammed breathless and witless against the ground, and the magician hurled into a tangle of thorns that cost him half his cloak and an eighth of his skin. They got up when they could and went limping in pursuit, leaning on one another. Neither one said a word. The way through the trees was easier for them than the unicorn had found it, for the red bull had been there since. Molly and the magician 
scrambled over great tree trunks, not only smashed, but trodden half way into the ground, and dropped to hands and knees to crawl around crevices they could not fathom in the dark. No hoofs could have made these, Molly thought dazedly. The earth had torn itself, shrinking from the burden of the bull. She thought of the unicorn and her heart paled. When they came out on the plain, they saw her, far and faint, a tuft of white water on the wind, almost invisible in the glare of the red bull. Molly grew, a little crazy with weariness and fear, saw them moving the way stars and stones move through space, forever falling, forever following, forever alone. The red bull would never catch the unicorn, not until now ca caught up with new, bygone with begin. Molly smiled serenely, but the blazing shadow loomed over the unicorn until the bull seemed to be all around her. She reared, swerved, and sprang away in another direction only to meet the bull there, his head lowered and his jaws drooling thunder. Again she turned, and again, backing and sidling, making crafty little dashes to this side or that, and each time the red bull headed her off by standing still. He did not attack, but he left her no way to go, save one. He's driving her, Schmendrick said quietly. If he wanted to kill her, he could have done it by now. He's driving her the way he drove the others, to the castle, to Haggard. I wonder why. Molly said, do something. Her voice was strangely calm and casual, and the magician answered her in the same tone. There is nothing I can do. The unicorn fled once more, pitifully tireless, and the red bull let her have room to run, but none to turn. When she faced him for a third time, she was close enough for Molly to see her hind legs shivering like those of a frightened dog. Now she set herself to stand, pawing at the ground wickedly and laying back her small, lean ears. But she could make no sound, and her horn did not gl grow bright again. She cowered when the red bull's bellow made the sky ripple and crack, and yet she did not back away. Please, Molly Grew said, please do something. Schmendrick turned on her, and his face was wild with helplessness. What can I do? What can I do with my magic? Hat tricks, penny tricks, or the one where I scramble stones to make an omelet? Would that entertain the red bull, do you think? Or shall I try the trick with the singing oranges? I'll try whatever you suggest, for I would certainly be happy of, to be of some practical use. Molly did not answer him. The bull came on, and the unicorn crouched lower and lower until she seemed to snap in two. Smendrick said, I know what to do. If I could, I'd change her into some other creature, some beast too humble for the bull to be concerned with. But only a great magician, a wizard like Nikos, who was my teacher, would have that kind of power. To transform a unicorn? Anyone who could do that could juggle the seasons and shuffle the years like playing cards. And yet I have no more power than you have. Less, for you can touch her and I cannot. Then, he said suddenly, Look, it's over.'